All right, the 60th Psalm. To the chief musician set to the lily of the testimony, a michtam of David, for teaching when he fought against Mesopotamia and Syria of Zobah, and Joab returned and killed 12,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. O oh God, you have cast us off. You have broken us down. You have displeased. You have been displeased. O oh, restore us again. You have made the earth tremble. You have broken it. Heal its breaches, for it is shaking. You have shown your people hard things. You have made us drink the wine of confusion. You have given a banner to those who fear you that it may de be displayed because of the truth, Selah, that your beloved may be delivered. Save with your right hand and hear me. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and measure out the valley of Sukkot. Gilead is mine and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the helmet for my head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my washpot. Over Edom I will cast my shoe. Philistia, shout in triumph because of me. Who will bring me to the strong city? Who will lead me to Edom? Is it not you, O God, who cast us off? And you, O God, who did not go out with our armies? Give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. Though God, through God, we will do valiantly, for it is he who shall tread down our enemies. It's the 60th Psalm. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for allowing us to come and congregate together in this beautiful green cathedral. And I would ask that you would bless each person here, that something will touch their heart and will help them to understand your nature better and that uh, we can fully appreciate who you are in all of your splendor. Thank you. Thank you for every good blessing you've given us. And I ask that you look with favor upon the people here and any affliction that they have, any trial, any trouble, any sadness, anything that's keeping them from turning around and being able to praise you, that you would tend to that so that they can praise you and not only do so, but to praise you with all of their fiber and all of their being and to want to cherish your word and read it all the days of their life that they can know you more intimately, more personally. And we pray these things in the beautiful, the exalted, in the glorious name of our Lord and Savior, who is Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, I got just a few announcements here. The first is, you know, I am always uh, available to pastor a church. If any you hear of a church in Sarasota that needs a pastor, I'd uh, be willing to do that. There have been times where this has been rained out in the middle of a sermon or uh, airplanes flying overhead or whatever's going on. So a uh, little stability would always be nice, but as long as the Lord has us out here, I'll be coming every single week. And uh, of course, if nobody here has ever been scripturally baptized, which is a uh, uh, reflection on the Old Testament where uh, they would uh, be, take a mitvah or a uh, ceremonial bath. And this was uh, brought in by uh, John the Baptist later as a uh, baptism of repentance. And then later after that, people were baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. And it was always done after conversion. Uh, people accepted the Lord and then they wanted to follow him in what's called believer's baptism, which is a picture of being buried with him in his grave and then being raised to new, newness of life through the power of the resurrection. Well, if anybody wants to follow in believer's baptism, I know that there's still water behind me and I'll take you out there any day of the week and we can do that. So uh, keep that in mind. Also, uh, Paul and Elaine, once again, there are missionaries in Japan that we support from this teeny little church. and. Uh, I would ask that each one of you would remember them in prayer. Um, I'm surprised that I haven't heard anything bad about Paul's health the entire time he's been gone because a couple days before he left, he had a, a heart murmur and a leaking blood valve or something in his heart. And uh, the Lord has just kept this guy strong even through that. And uh, he's doing well. They've uh, uh, converted a young lady named Mie and uh, they are just doing great things over there. So please keep Paul and Elaine in prayer. And uh, in the upcoming elections, I need not tell you what I already have said a million times and what I'm going to speak about today is that uh, there are, in my opinion, and I believe it's backed up by the Bible, there are three issues that will bring destruction on America. The first is the homosexual agenda. The second is abortion. And the third is not supporting the nation of Israel. Those three things, I believe, are a part of God's very nature and his heart. And... Uh, so uh, there's one party that is actively supporting the homosexual issue in their 2012 pat platform. There's the same party that uh, it, it, it believes in death on uh, request. I mean, that's all there is to it when it comes to abortion. And uh, then they also are showing their true colors by not really supporting the nation of Israel. And it's becoming more and more evident as time goes by. So please keep that in mind. Be careful how you vote because God will not be mocked. 
Um, I have some Church on the Beach flyers here. If anybody wants to take those and hand them out, please do. And uh, just so you know, this is the 41st sermon that we're doing in the Genesis series. So uh, I know that Kelly Carlin has been here for every single one of them without missing one. She's survived through rainstorms. She's survived through the hurricane that came through twice, the same hurricane, and uh, mosquitoes. And she's gone through everything. So once again, I have to thank Kelly for doing that because, you know, it, it just means a great deal to me that she's got this thing about not missing these. And she says, I don't want to watch them on YouTube. So... And everybody else that comes, I so much appreciate it. I know there's a couple guys that just walked up and they drive a long way to get here. And every time they come, I'm so thankful for that because, I mean, it just it never ceases to astonish me that the drive they make to come down here. So thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to do a New Testament reading today, which I normally do. I've been saying this for weeks. One week it was because we had a rainstorm coming right at us another week something came up oh paul showed up to uh, play music for us and now this week uh the reason why i'm not going to do a new testament reading is because it is rosh hashanah which is the um uh, first day of the new year in israel but it comes from leviticus chapter 23 it starts in the 23rd verse and i'm going to read you this and rather than do a new testament reading i'd rather explain to you the significance of this day and so, uh, and I'm not going to go into detail. I, you know, I've done a Rosh Hashanah sermon. It is online. I'm not going to go into de detail about this, but I will explain the ultimate significance of this day. There are eight feasts of the Lord that are detailed in Leviticus 23. And uh, this is the third to the last. After this, in 10 days, there will be uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And then after that, five days will be Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a week-long feast. But... Um, Leviticus 23, 23 says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, which is today, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing trumpets, a holy convocation. So to get us in the right mood, I brought my uh, trumpet, which I got when I was in Israel, and uh, we'll go ahead and usher in Rosh Hashanah in fine fashion. <laughs> Praise the Lord for his goodness to us. All right, so uh, Leviticus 23, uh, 23 through I think it was 25 that I just read, describes the uh, feast Yom Teruel, which is the day of signals, which is specifically uh, the blowing of the trumpet. And uh, it is the least described sermon in the Leviticus 23 sermons. It's almost hidden there. Every other one of the feasts is specifically indicated as having been fulfilled in the New Testament, such as Passover, Christ our Passover lamb is sacrificed for us, or the um, uh, Feast of First Fruits. It says, Christ our First Fruits is risen. Each one of those is specifically, Paul specifically says it is fulfilled. Yom Kippur is fulfilled and Christ is our propitiation and he uses the word hilasterion from the Greek, which is the mercy seat. And that's the exact word that was used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament 250 years before Christ to describe the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant is the Hilasterion. Each one of them, um, uh, John 1.14 is the Feast of Tabernacles. It says that uh, he came and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And what that means when it says he dwelt among us is the word tabernacled, skenao. He literally put on a tabernacle of flesh and he dwelt among us. So all of them, and I know I'm skipping one or two of them, but they're all fulfilled literally and specifically by the mouth of either John or Paul, except for one, and that is Rosh Hashanah. And Rosh Hashanah, a lot of people say that, well, that pictures the rapture of the church, and it very well may be. Any of the feasts of the Lord seem to indicate the rapture of the church, but the uh, specific significance of Rosh Hashanah is that it is the head of the year, but it is also the birthday of Jesus Christ. And we can know this specifically from the Bible because in the book of Luke, uh, chapter one, it says that Zacharias, the husband of Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist, was in the temple and it says that he was of the tribe of Abia, A-B-I-J-A-H, okay? Now, he was in the tribe or in the clan of Abia, in the tribe of Levi, and what he was doing was serving at Jerusalem. And there were 24 courses of Israelites to do this. David assigned them in 
1 Chronicles chapter 24, I believe. I may be wrong on that. Anyway, it might be 14. But uh, anyway, he assigned them in order. The beginning of the Jewish year in the Bible, not that they're celebrating today, which is the first of the year for the Jewish calendar now. The biblical Jewish year was changed by God from Tishri to the month of Nisan. That's in the book of Exodus. And from that day, you can go forward. He is the tribe of Abia, which was the eighth tribe listed in one Chronicles. Okay, so you count two weeks for each course of Levites. Levites, And that uh, you will come up to the date that he would have been in Jerusalem serving. There's no doubt about it. There's, it's very easy to do this calculation. From there, you go six months forward because it says in the sixth month, speaking of um, Elizabeth bearing Jesus in the sixth month, the angel went to visit uh, Mary and he gave her the words that she would bear a child even though she's a virgin. Okay, so from that point, she goes down, she spends time with Elizabeth until uh, uh, John the Baptist is born. She goes back. We know specifically, it, you can do the calculation. I've got it all on my uh, page on the website. I also have it on my YouTube page. I've got all of it, all of the numbers, all of the dating. You can see everything very clearly, but it takes a lot of work to figure this out. Well, from that point that um, Jesus uh, she went back up there. We know the amount of time it is for the human gestation, which is 270 days. And from the date of the birth of John the Baptist, we go for it and it takes you directly to the day Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah. So today is the day of, days of birth of Jesus Christ. And interestingly enough, you can go to uh, Chabad.com, I think it is. They have a, a calendar of all the events in Jewish history. And they go back there and uh, they state with all certainty that it is also the day that Adam was created. And we can know that as well from the Bible. It's not hard to uh, determine either because we, the dating during the time of Noah, we know the first month of the year and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so Adam was created on that day, which was the first of Tishri. And I can imagine a trumpet was probably blown at that time at the marvel of God's creation, his finest creation, which is man. And then exactly, exactly to the day Several thousand years later, it was 4,000, about 4,000 years later, Jesus Christ was born on that day. So we have a pattern which is explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which says that Adam is the first man, Jesus is the second man. He replaces the deeds of Adam. Adam sinned, all are condemned under sin because of uh, Adam. We are, are all fallen by nature, and Jesus Christ came to replace that. He was born of the Holy Spirit and of a woman, so he did not inherit Adam's sin, and therefore he was qualified to replace the first man. Doesn't mean he did it. He had to live a sinless life as well as being born sinless. He did live sinlessly. He prevailed over sin. He never committed a sin, and then he gave his life as an exchange for our fallen state. And so, thank you. And so, uh, uh, sorry, she walked in front of the camera, kind of threw me off there a little bit. Anyway, um, uh, so the idea is, although it is not explicitly stated in the New Testament, it is implicitly stated in the New Testament that Jesus Christ was born on Rosh Hashanah and that he replaces the fallen man, Adam. And what we're asked to do is to transfer our sin to him. And then from there, he transfers his righteousness to us. So please keep that in mind. Um, that's... Uh, 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 just a short narrative. I'm sorry I kind of got a little off on that, but uh, uh, I think I covered all the major bases of what occurred on that particular day. Adam was created, Jesus Christ was born, and that is the significance of Rosh Hashanah. But once again, the rapture very well may occur on this day as well. It could occur on any of the feast days, I believe, because the Passover indicates our redemption from sin. Well, what a better day to be redeemed or the next feast in order is the Feast of Bikarim, or First Fruits. And that's the day that Jesus Christ was resurrected. Well, what a great day to be glorified along with him on the same day. Or the uh, third feast would be um, uh, the Feast of Weeks, which is Shavuot, or Pentecost. That's the day that the Holy Spirit was poured out on all of us. And that was 50 days uh, in Israel today. They call it counting the Omer, and they come to this uh, feast day, which is Shavuot. Well, that, according to Luke, was fulfilled in Acts chapter uh, 2. The Holy Spirit was poured out on that 50th day afterward. And so what a great day for us to be 
called home on the same day the Holy Spirit was given, he's taken out. And we'll talk about that today. Or as you can see, any of the feast days may picture the rapture. But what we're going to do today is we are going to give an Old Testament picture of what is coming. And that'll be in the sermon, which will be Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 through 11. But before I get into that, I always, and you know I love to do this, this is one of my favorite things about preaching, is giving this day in history. Because I learn a lot. I go and sit down on Sunday morning and I read about what happened this day in history. And it gives me a chance to know what's happened in, uh, in the past. So on this day in history, which is today is 16 September, in 1620, the Mayflower left England with 102 people at, uh, and they arrived at Provincetown on November 21st. First, and then they arrived at Plymouth on December 26th, which was the day after Christmas, obviously. And the first thing that they did, they didn't do that on this day, but they left on this day. But the first thing they did when they did arrive was to establish a contract with the one true creator God. And therefore, there are only two nations in human history which have done this. The first was when God made a covenant with the people of Israel from God to man. And America made a covenant from man to God. But there are only two nations in human history that have done this. So um, uh, here's a couple of the words that they say in the Mayflower Compact. They say, in the name of God, amen. And they go down a little bit and it says, having undertaken for the glory of God and advancements of the Christian faith. So the very purpose of America was to establish the Christian faith. There we go. Um, in 1630 on this day, the village of Shamot changed its name to Anybody? Shamot, Massachusetts became Boston, Massachusetts. And uh, the uh, two places that I preached on as I traveled around America, I preached on abortion in two places and there were obvious reasons why. One was in Shamot or Boston and the other was in San, um, uh, Sacramento, California because they are the two states which are the most liberal in this nation and the two which promote abortion the most. And so uh, anyway, Shamot changed its name to Boston at that time. In 1782, the first official use of the Great Seal of the United States was placed on a document to negotiate a prisoner of war agreement with Britain, okay? And then in 1908, we had something called General Motors established. It was uh, founded by a guy named, I hate to even say his name, William Crapo, Billy Durant. Anyway, what he did is he uh, merged the Buick Company and the Oldsmobile Company. And because we're right here in Sarasota and you all have heard of Oldsmar, you probably don't know where that name came from, but that is actually something that Ransom Olds went down to Florida to establish Oldsmar as a car industry town. Well, that never worked out, but the name stuck and now it's kind of one of these retirement villages type of places outside of uh, Tampa. But anyway, um, this guy Durant uh, formed the General Motors Company and then a you know, what was it, 1908, about a hundred and some, almost a hundred years exactly, uh, it went into bankruptcy and instead of uh, filing for bankruptcy, we bailed it out and is still to this day not profitable. It's uh, the, the uh, car companies that didn't take government money all got back on their feet the way that capitalism normally does. And um, we have government motors instead of general motors, but that was 1908. And then in 1976, something happened, which is kind of personal to, I'm sure, my brother and I, because we grew up going to St. Boniface Episcopal Church at the north end of this key. And uh, even at that time, it was very liberal. And we didn't know what liberal theology was. We were just children, so we went there with our parents. But um, the Episcopal Church used to be a very strong denomination. They proclaimed Jesus Christ. They, um, uh, George Washington, our first president, was an Episcopal. He was a devout man of God. And uh, it was a, a, a very strong denomination, part of the Anglican Church. And uh, eventually it started to apostatize, which means to walk away from the truth. And in 1976, the Episcopal Church formally approved women to be ordained as priests and bishops, which is 100% contrary to the Bible. There's uh, the book of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and Titus chapter 1 give the requirements for being a, you know, in one of these positions and it doesn't include women. It's very specific. If you want to read it sometime, those are the two places to go, but it's also hinted at through the whole New Testament, okay, that women are not to be ordained as ministers. And so they've fallen away from that. And then of course they, in uh, sometime later, Gene Robinson, the uh, active homosexual was appointed a bishop of the, uh, 
of the Episcopal Church. So they have completely apostatized. There is nothing Christian about that church anymore. And it's very sad because if you go in and you listen to the liturgy, the music, it's just beautiful. But there's no heart for Jesus Christ anymore. I'm, I'm very, very sad to see what's happened to so many once faithful denominations. But we'll get away from that and we'll make a, no, we won't. We won't get away from that. J.C. Penney was born on this day in 1875, and I'm sure he is turning over in his grave. A Christian man founding a Christian company in America, and now they have Ellen DeGeneres as their spokesperson. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's so sad what's happened in this America, in this country, uh, through the, the, just the dealings of wicked people. And as I said, and I want to announce this right now before I go any further, that today's sermon is going to be on those particular subjects. And if you don't want to hear about it, I would ask you to just go ahead and leave now because I, I will pull no punches. That's all there is to it. I will speak on Sodom and Gomorrah for what it is. One final thing happened on this day in 1927, and I just love the man. I, I doubt if he's a Christian, but Peter Falk was born. And man, Columbo, I got to tell you, he's, he really was a great actor, and I think he's still alive. Um, he did a, a couple of uh, really funny movies. He did one called, I think it was The In-Laws with Alan Arkin. It was just, it, it was a classic. Anyway, um, uh, Peter Falk, and that's this day in history, which is 16 September. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and read one more psalm before we get started, just to uh, get us in a happier mood. It'll be the 61st psalm. And I think I read these in a, a, a church on the beach recently, but they're so nice. And I just thought I just want to read both of them. So here we go. Psalm 61 to the chief musician on a stringed instrument, a psalm of David. Hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth, I will cry to you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a shelter for me, a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings, Selah. For you, O God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. You will prolong the king's life, his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. Oh, prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. So I will praise your name. I will sing praise to your name forever that I may daily perform my vows. Heavenly Father, one more quick prayer to you, just asking you to uh, be, with, be with us during this difficult sermon and something that is a part of your heart and it's also a part of your very nature because you are righteous and you are just and you must judge sin in the human person. And so I would ask that you look favorably with what I say, uh, maybe alert somebody walking by to hear something that will help them to understand your nature more clearly. And despite the talk about these things, we do know that you're also a loving creator. You're merciful and you're truthful. You are great and you are glorious. And we just want to give you glory and honor and praise. Oh God, what a beautiful creator you are. All hail you in the splendid name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, as I said, today is Genesis chapter 19, verses 1 through 11. This is called Destruction is Coming, Shadows of the Rapture. Now, one of the most disputed doctrines in, to be found anywhere in Christian circles comes out of the Bible. And in modern times, people love to argue over it. And there are those that even deny that it will occur. They take clear and concise passages from the Bible, which simply can't mean anything else. And they will close their eyes to them. They will run from them. They will hide from them. They will poo-poo them. They will belittle them when analyzed as they should be. And they will laugh at those who believe them, just as they're written. And I'm talking about the rapture. It is something that is so clear and concise in the Bible, I don't know how people can come to the conclusions they do, but they do. But then, of course, there are those who believe in the rapture because of the same clear and concise passages. But they, de they demonstrate a, a, a willingness to argue over the timing of it. When will the rapture happen? Is it going to occur before the Antichrist arrives? Is it going to occur after he's revealed? Will it happen before the tribulation period? During the tribulation period? Will it happen at the end of the tribulation period? Will there be a partial rapture? Will there be several raptures? Will this happen? Will that happen? People will argue about this. They will fight about it. They'll even point at each other and they will cry heretic over an issue which is not a heretical issue at all anyway. But it's a mess and it causes many people to simply just wring their hands and get all uh, up in arms about 
something that is future that we can only look at and analyze. So I want people to understand not to get exhausted over rapture verses, but to understand that it will happen. And the Lord is very clear about that. People will spend their time reading the Left Behind series and they'll actually quote it. I sit out there with my sign and uh, you know, Bible questions ask and they'll come up and they'll quote the Left Behind books to me rather than reading and quoting their Bible. And the reason why is because Left Behind is so much easier to read and it's somebody else's opinion and so you get that inserted into you and you don't have to think instead of reading something of overwhelming complexity which is the pages of the Holy Bible. And of course there are those who will take passages about the rapture completely out of context. If you know what the rapture is, I am sure you have heard this particular verse quoted a million times and ha having seen it applied to the rapture. Here's what Jesus said, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. I gotta tell you what, that is not a rapture verse. It cannot be applied to the rapture. Let me go on with that a little bit. It says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the son of man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the son of man be. As I said, this is not a rapture verse and it cannot be applied to the rapture. If you want me to explain later why, I will. I'm not gonna get into the details now. The truth of what is said in that statement though may be applied to the rapture, that we simply have no idea when it's gonna occur. All, all I can tell you is that it will occur and it will occur in the future and we don't know exactly when. Like most things though, in the New Testament, there are things in the Old Testament will give us hints about this particular issue or that particular issue and the rapture is one of them. The rapture is something that it is a glorious moment for Christians and it really is coming and it's something that we need to hold into our hearts closely because it, is, it should be the hope of every believer in Jesus Christ because at that moment we are going to see his face. Let me go ahead and give you a text verse for today. This is from Revelation 4.1. Before I give you the text verse, I wanna ask a very specific question. Revelation chapter one, two, and three are directed to who? Can anybody tell me who they're directed to? They're directed to the church, specifically to the church. He's writing to the church of Philadelphia, the church at this and the church at that. It is Jesus Christ writing to his church. And then in Revelation 4, 1, he's going to say something. And from Revelation 4, 2, all the way to chapter 19 of Revelation, he is going to be speaking about the seven year tribulation period, which is directed at the nation of Israel. Okay, the church is never mentioned during that time. In fact, the church comes back with Jesus in chapter 19. So here's what we have. We're gonna establish with our text first for today, a premise for the rapture. After these things, meaning after I've spoken to my church, after these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice I heard, which uh, was speaking like a trumpet, speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you things which must take place after this. Now that voice that he heard, he turned around and he saw the risen Christ, okay? So now what he's going to do for the rest of chapter four, all the way through 19 is describe what is going to happen on earth while we are with the Lord, waiting to come back after seven years. There is a door standing open in heaven and its access is granted through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so may God speak to us through his word today and may his glorious name ever be praised. Now our first thought today is the question, who is righteous among you? Last week we saw the Lord's intentions to head to Sodom because of the outcry against it. After that, we witnessed Abraham's concern for the righteous within the city and his appeal to the Lord to spare the city if only 10 righteous people could be found. And today we will discover if that low, low number was actually attainable or not. Are there 10 righteous people in Walmart? Let's see how low we can go. Well, the question is, right here, we're gonna talk about it. Verse one of chapter 19. No, now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening. The two men who were with the Lord and who met with him and who dined with him. Up there with Abraham, they were with the Lord. They have now arrived in Sodom. And twice in the Hebrew, the term used for these two men is malachim or angels. These two are being sent 
on a duty as messengers. In other words, it is describing their office and not specifically their nature. Because of this, whether they are actually angels or just divine messengers is not really known. And we can't fully determine that from the text. It's evening time and it's probably still very hot outside. So when the two with the Lord came to meet Abraham, he was sitting in the tent of the door. And remember I talked about it, he's sitting there because he's trying to catch a cool breeze. It was the time of the year when it was very hot and the same, they've come down, it's the evening time, but it's probably still true as they arrive in Sodom, even though it's the evening time. And we know that from the continuation of verse one, it says, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. The gate and the walls of Middle Eastern cities are usually built out of stone and they have a big arch over them and in both sides is a deep recess. And if you've ever been to the old city of Jerusalem, you'll see this, you know, you can get a car through there. They're very small, but there's these recesses on the side. And in these recesses, they built seating where people could relax, where they could conduct business, they could guard the city, or they could judge cases. And we'll find that out as we go through the Bible, that this is the place where judgment was held. We go to a courthouse where they went to the gates of the city. These recesses though would be in the shade. They'd be out of the way of the, the afternoon sun. And so here is Lot sitting in one of these recesses and he's catching a cool breeze just as Abraham was at the tent of his door. And while he's sitting there, he may be acting as a judge even at this current time. He is certainly a judge in Sodom, but he may be sitting there waiting to judge a case. And we will get this from something that somebody says to him later in this account today. On other occasions, as I said, when we get through the Old Testament, we will see the judges meeting right at the gates of the city. You see it in the book of Ruth, for example, when the transaction is made for Boaz to receive her as a wife. It was done at the gates of the city. And we're gonna see this again and again and again throughout the Old Testament. Along with being a judge though, Lot is probably just a very nice guy and he would be sitting out there in the evening time in case somebody was walking along, coming into Sodom and they didn't have a place to stay, then he would go out and maybe invite him to his house to have a meal or something. And this is probably his daily habit. He could sit there, he could watch the world go by, he could wait on judging somebody's case and he could also invite people over to his house. And we continue with verse one. When Lot saw them, meaning the two men, he rose to meet them and he bowed himself with his face to the ground. Now, last week or two weeks ago, I believe it was in the sermon two weeks ago, when Abraham fell on his face before the Lord, it was in respect, it was in humility, and it was a sign of worship. What Lot is doing here is a sign of respect and humility, but there is no worship. There are plenty of other examples in the Old Testament to show people bowing in front of other people without worshiping. And so I wanna read you one so you know that I'm not making this up, that he's not actually bowing in worship because people, believe it or not, will get off on all kinds of tangents about things like this in the Bible if they're not careful. So let me read you this from 1 Samuel where David meets his very best friend, Jonathan, in the fields before he flees from the presence of King Saul. Here's what it says. As soon as the lad had gone, meaning the arrow bearer of Jonathan, Jonathan went out to shoot arrows and uh, he went and picked up the arrows that Jonathan had shot and then he uh, took off. It says, as soon as the lad had gone, David arose from a place toward the south, fell on his face to the ground and bowed down three times. And he's obviously not worshiping his best friend, Jonathan. And they kissed one another and they wept together, but David more so. Then Jonathan said to David, go in peace, since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord saying, may the Lord be between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he arose and departed and Jonathan went into the city. So what Lot is doing here by bowing to these two men who show up at the city gates is just esteeming others better than himself. And this is exactly what we as Christians are taught to do throughout the entire Bible. A very good example of that is found in Philippians chapter two, where it says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And we come to verse two. And he said, here now, my lords, please turn into your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, no, but we will spend the night in the open square. Now, Lot doesn't just greet these strangers with humility by bowing down to him, but he offers them his home as a sign of hospitality as well. What he is doing he is he is demonstrating his own righteousness in the presence of complete strangers. 
And because of the time of day, we can guess that he knows they can't walk far enough to get to another town before it turns into nightfall. And so they're either going to have to sleep on the open road or, as they said, we'll sleep in the open square. But either one is going to be very dangerous. The open road had bandits. The open square, Lot knew very well in Sodom, was not a place to be speaking, sleeping. And we have an account which is very similar to this in the New Testament, in the book of Luke, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, when two people were walking along the road to Emmaus, and they came across Jesus. They talked to him, and let me read you the account. It says here, Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. It is generosity, just like this, that the Bible asks us to demonstrate or to display to others. And I know it is a very difficult thing to do in this world. It's a very wicked world. And when we invite somebody in like that, we don't know if we're inviting in a mass murderer or an angel. But the Bible does ask us to be kind to strangers. And in fact, there are rewards for doing so. The book of Hebrews chapter 13 is very, very specific in what it says. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. And guess what? Lot is doing exactly that right now. He's entertaining angels without even realizing it. Verse 3, but he insisted so strongly, meaning Lot, so they turned into him and entered his house. Then they, he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. Now I'm going to show you another set of verses from 2 Samuel chapter 15, which is very similar to this. And then I want to point out the differences so you can see how these things interact in the Bible. This is an account of Absalom, the son of King David, and how he dealt with people at the city gates as well. It says, after this, this it happened that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Sounds like our presidential entourage nowadays. Now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate. So it was whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision that Absalom would call out to him and say, what city are you from? And he would say, your servant is from such and such a tribe of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your case is good and right, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you. Moreover, Absalom would say, oh, that I were made a judge in the land and everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me, then I would give him justice. And so it was whenever when anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. Lot at the gate of the city was genuinely concerned about the people he was inviting to his home. There was no selfish amb ambition and there was no thought of getting paid or somehow return favor for his efforts. He was simply a nice guy and he was taking care of strangers. On the other hand, Absalom met people at exactly the same location, the gates of the city, and he appeared to be a nice guy, but what he actually wanted to do was to overthrow his own father, the king of Israel, which he did do, and he wanted to steal the kingdom for himself, which he did temporarily. In the end though, what he did cost him his life and on the contrary, what Lot did saved his life. When the Lord comes at the rapture, he will save all of the righteous, just like he did for Lot. Those left behind are going to face very terrible times as the world spins into chaos and into destruction. People have a choice to make about Jesus and the consequences are real. Lot made a feast for his guests and the Lord is preparing a feast for his guests. The question is, are you going to be joining him? Let's go on to our second thought of the day, which is in a world of wickedness. Verse four, now before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, and all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. I thought about these particular verses when I was typing this up and how they compare to the world in which we live in. This is for, Sod, it's a, uh, for Lot in Sodom, it's about bedtime and it says both young and old came together. The sin of Sodom is so great that those who are too young to participate and those who are too old to participate still came out just to watch. The people from every part of this city came to join in this perverted party. 
What these people are proposing is a, an offense of the deepest perversion found in humanity. It is the sin for which Sodom is still known to this day. And Paul, in the book of Romans, cites this depravity as that which occurs when people have completely suppressed the knowledge of God. There is nothing left but animal sense in people that practice this. And yet, I hate to tell you, animals aren't even so disposed. And yet, and yet, and yet it is this perversion which the Democrat Party of the United States of America has added as coming under the protection of their party platform. I got to tell you something, the day, the day that Barack Obama was sworn into office, not five minutes after that occurred, the website for the White House of the United States of America on its home page had LGBT, the homosexual, homosexual agenda, right on its home page five minutes afterwards. And how do I know? Because I went and read the, the website. As soon as he was sworn into office, they loaded that garbage up there and it is something that should not have been tolerated. And yet we are going into this headlong in America. The judgment of America is going to partially be meted meet out because of the sins of Sodom. The perversion of homosexuality along with the crime of abortion and a refusal to support the nation of Israel are going to bring us under judgment unless we as a nation stem this unholy tide which is rolling across our land. Election year 2012 is as important as any time in our history. Now, I got to tell you what though, the book is already written. It says revelation on the end of it because it is revealing Jesus Christ. We already know that we're heading in that disaster, but that does not negate our guilt when we vote improperly. All right. And it also tells us just as a, a, a point of thought in my head that because it says revelation at the end of the Bible and everything that was is now restored, everything bad that has happened is now made good. We can't add anything to this book. It is sealed. We cannot add a book of Mormon. We cannot add a, any other books and call it the Holy Bible because it is complete. It has revealed our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now I wanna tell you, it's true. Today, we don't openly gather in the streets to rape every stranger that comes around, but young and old alike, perverts from every dark corner of the cities of every town in the world can sit at home and they can watch any filthy thing they want right over the internet or right over the TV. The porn industry in America alone is valued at $15 billion. And it is the number one search on internet search engines day after day after day, porn. Those who sit at their computer or those who watch this kind of stuff on TV are no different than those who came in the city to watch what was gonna happen. Without an audience, these actors would have been left to their own devices. But the more people who come out to watch these things, the more depraved the actions of those who actually participate in will be. How much more so when our president and our congressional leaders march at the head of this parade of perversion. Let's go to verse six. So Lot went out to meet them, went out to them through the doorway, shut the door behind and said, please my brethren, do not do so wickedly. Lot here is in an act of true bravery. What he does is he shuts the door and he puts himself between the visitor and all of these perverts that are out in the city. And he could do this. I'm gonna tell you the perfection of what God has given us in the Holy Bible. If you think about everything that has happened to this point, if you listen to any of these sermons and you know what happened before this, he could only do this because of what happened in the past. If you remember, there was a battle between four kings of the east and the five kings of Sodom. And these four kings of the east came down and they captured Lot and they captured all of the people in Sodom and they carried him off. And what happened? Abraham went after them and he rescued all of the people. He got all of their goods back and he defeated the four kings and he killed their entire army. Had that not happened, Lot could not have gone out in front of all of these people. But because of this happening, the way that it did, Lot was safe because these people would have felt some type of debt to him possibly. And he just, there's no way he could have done it any other way. But the people of the town knew him well enough and they knew what was coming if they were to harm Lot that 
they left him alone. If you see what I'm saying, the, just the perfection of how everything has happened step by step by step from Genesis 1-1 all the way to where we are today, every single thing naturally leads to the next. It's beautifully composed. The custom of many of the people of the Mideast has not changed for thousands of years. And I can assure you, it's this way to this day. If you go into a person's home over in the Middle East, you have come under the protection of their roof and they will do anything to keep you safe and to keep you happy. Lot feels this responsibility towards these particular men because they have come under his roof and therefore under his, his protection. And he will do every single thing possible to take care of these people, including putting his own life at risk and also putting his own family at risk, as we're gonna see in the next verse. Verse eight, see now, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Please let me bring them out to you and you may do to them as you wish. Only do nothing to these men since it is the reason they have come under the shadow of my roof. Lot offers his two virgin daughters in exchange for these two men. And to this day, he has been hated by feminists, he's been chastised by theologians, and he has been thought ill of by Bible readers of all sorts. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, the great scholar of ages past, had this to say about this particular incident. He said, of two evils, we must choose the less, but of two sins, we must choose neither. So he contradicts himself right there because it's the same thing. And then he goes on to say, nor ever do evil that good may come of it. So he makes another contradiction on his first premise. So he's very confused about what's going on and he doesn't know how to defend it and he doesn't know how to properly say it's wrong either. So he says something that makes no sense. Unfortunately, people don't think things through. And what they do is they go straight to emotions and they say, oh, those poor girls, the people were going to do harm regardless. It doesn't matter what Lot did. One thing is absolutely certain, evil was going to ensue. No matter what he did, they were coming after him. And he knew this, and so he did the most logical thing that a person could expect, and that was to offer his two daughters. Now, why was this logical? Don't get excited yet. Hold on, hold on. It was logical because first, they were already engaged to two men. We're gonna see that in next week's sermon, all right? If they accepted the offer of his two daughters, the first thing it would do would put a division between the people that knew this and supported the marriage. So that's already lining things up as a way of getting the crowds to think things through. The second is because they were his daughters. He's saying, I'm gonna do this in exchange for these people. It would hopefully get the crowd to reason through that he's making this offer out of an impassioned plea and to get the people to feel ashamed over their very actions. There's no proof that he actually would have given his daughters out. You see the logic there. The third thing is that they were a part of Abraham's extended family and so they would have every reason to be afraid because if they actually did anything, the man who just killed four kings and their entire armies lived just a couple of miles away and I guarantee you he would be merciless in what he did to the town of Lot. He rescued the entire lot and four other cities. You think he couldn't take care of these people? Of course he could. And finally, these people were perverts. They were homosexual perverts. And so an offer of women would be contrary to the very nature of the rule of the mob they were facing. So in every consideration, Lot's decision is by far the best course of action involved, including for the girls. And that brings us to our third and final thought today, which is shadows of the rapture. Verse nine. And they said, stand back. Then they said, this one came in here, came here to stay here and he keeps acting as a judge. Now we will deal worse than you, than with them. So they pressed hard against the man Lot and came near to break down the door. This verse takes us right back to verse one where Lot was at the city gate. He acts like a judge because he was a judge. He was right there at the gate. It's very probable, although it's not stated that he was appointed as a judge after the defeat of the kings. Abraham, in gratitude to him, they said, we're gonna make your nephew a judge in the town of Sodom. Now, that's not biblical. I mean, it's not in there. It's just a supposition, but it's a very good one. Whether this is the correct case or not, though, he does sit in the gates of the city and he is a noted judge. But the crowd is no longer interested in authority and it has determined to cast off that authority. And I'd like to make a modern parallel right now, which is these Occupy movements, where these people get out into the cities and they don't obey any of the authority that is appointed over them. 
Anybody that comes in and tries to say you need to do this or that and this is part of our city ordinance, they couldn't care. You have the same things going on in America and they're getting worse by the month. Every month they get a little bit worse where people just are shunning authority. And these people here in Sodom have rejected authority. And so they do exactly what I said a moment ago. They reject his offer of the women. They are not only perverts, but they have become unreasonably violent by the conduct of their wicked lives. The translators of the Geneva Bible give a comment about this particular verse, and they don't give a lot of comments in the Geneva Bible, but here's what they say. Nothing is more dangerous than to live where sin reigns, for it corrupts all. So please remember that as you go into wherever you go throughout the week, that if you get too close to sin, it will harm you as well. I don't care how Christian you are. Pastors are not free from this. We see it all the time. Pastors falling all over America because they go where sin reigns. Very wise of the uh, Geneva Bible translators. It's a lesson that Lot learned the hard way. Verse 10, but the men reached out their hands and pulled Lot into the house with them and shut the door. Lot is brought into complete safety away from the wickedness of the people and believe it or not, he is brought into the presence of the Lord. Now, we don't know this yet. We're going to see this in next week's sermon. But there is a term that they use later when speaking to somebody behind the door, which indicates that the Lord is there with him. Once that door is shut, everything else is excluded. But the Lord is back there behind the door. And that's an important thing to understand. And it also is a parallel to something that happened in the New Testament. If you remember, after the resurrection, one week after the resurrection, all of the disciples were sitting in a room and it says the door was locked, and it says the Lord appeared to him there. So these locked doors have nothing to keep the Lord out. He can come in and out of wherever he wants in time and space because he created time and space and matter. And he has showed up with the other two men, and he is behind that door, and Lot is in the presence with them. Verse 11, and they struck the men who were at the doorway of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they became weary trying to find the door. The type of blindness, or as it says in Hebrew, blindness says, is the word bansan verim. And it's only used two times in the entire Old Testament. The other time is in the book of two kings. It's in chapter 6, verse 18. And it is recorded here. I want to give you a little bit of background on it. Is that the people in Syria keep getting overthrown and they keep not being able to achieve their goals. And the king of Syria says, uh, you know, who is it that's in my council, basically, who's telling Israel what's going on and they say no 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 you misunderstood there's a prophet in Israel and he knows everything you do he has the ear of the Lord and so anything that you do he already knows and so he's telling them and that's why we can't win in any of these battles etc that's kind of what's going on so what he does is he sends an army from Syria down to get this prophet of the Lord and here we'll pick up right here so when the Syrians came down to him Elisha prayed to the Lord and said strike this people I pray with blindness and he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. The blindness that they are experiencing is a very peculiar sort that has much less to do with the eyes than it does with the mind. The heads of the people in Sodom, just like the people who are around Elisha in this town of Dothan, were confused and their thinking was clouded. It's a state of blindness which is much more mental and spiritual than it is physical. And we know this because Elisha took that army of the Syrians and he led them all the way from Dothan down to Samaria. And they followed him. Okay, so they can't see. They're just very confused in their thinking. The people of Sodom grope for the door. Now remember, they're standing right there. The guys pulled Lot back in and they closed the door. And they're groping for the door and they can't find it. The door is there. It is right there. In other words, the very thing which they are intent upon finding is the thing that they cannot see. It is as if they see a door and they think it's a thorn bush, or they see a thorn bush and they think it's a door. Now, have any of you seen how these verses are starting to picture the coming rapture? What we're gonna do is we're gonna stand back and we're gonna look at the whole scene as described by Peter in the time before Christ comes and compare it with how the Bible describes Sodom and Gomorrah right here. Here's what Peter says about the wickedness of the world which will receive God's judgment. In these verses, he compares it with the righteousness of Lot. And as I said, notice the similarity between the world at that time and the world of Sodom that we're looking about. And kind of think about our liberal progressive leaders as well and what they're heading us towards. 
with their policies that I mentioned, the White House website and all that, because it all fits perfectly. Listen to this. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, of, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust for punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Just think of our country right now, all right? Whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. As you can see, the state of Sodom was as the state of the world is right now. And later in the same epistle that Peter writes, he says this about the destruction he just described and the hope of the believer. Remember, these concepts are made in comparison to Sodom right before its destruction. He says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will heat melt with fervent heat. Kind of sounds like nuclear war to me. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be deserved, dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking forward and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. There he builds upon what Isaiah says back in his book. In the time of wickedness, which precedes the destruction, Lot was grabbed physically. He was snatched back through the door and the angels rescued him from the people's evil intent. And this is exactly how Paul describes the rapture, which is coming in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Here's what Paul says. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. The word that the, Paul uses in this particular set of verses for caught up is the word harpagesathema. And some people know it in its root form. It's much easier to say harpazo. It means to seize or to carry off by force or to snatch away. And this is exactly the picture that we were given of Lot being snatched right back into safety by these two angels. And then they shut the door behind him and he was in the presence of the Lord. If you remember, after Lot was pulled to safety, that door was shut and nobody could open it. And everybody outside was excluded from the safety within the house. Now listen to how Jesus describes the same condition to the church in Philadelphia in Revelation, I believe it's chapter three, and the protection that they will receive just as Lot was in Sodom. Here's what he said. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the keys of David, once again, building on Isaiah, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it for you have little strength, have kept my word and have not denied my name. Indeed, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews, but are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to persevere, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have that no one may take your crown. There is an hour of trial which is coming upon the whole world and the world is going to be destroyed because of the wickedness of the people. But we are promised safety from this, just as Lot was. Here's how Paul describes it in the next chapter. I read you 1 Thessalonians 4. Now we go into chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. He says, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. 
for those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let those who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he's making a pun here because Jesus' name is salvation. It's Yeshua in Hebrew, which means salvation, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. We are not appointed to wrath, but we are appointed to receive salvation through the Messiah. And in his second letter, that was the first letter to Thessalonians, in the second letter, Paul explains the timing and what will occur right at that moment and after that moment. Now listen real carefully and see if you can see the parallel of what we just saw that happened to the people after Lot was pulled through the door. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? He's writing to the Thessalonians about his first letter. And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time, speaking of the Antichrist. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way, which is the Holy Spirit being taken out with the believers. And then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and the destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the work of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Now listen to this carefully. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned, who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Lot was pulled through the door into safety, and only after that were the people given this blindness, or bansan verim in Hebrew. And remember how I explained it. This was a mental or a spiritual blindness. It wasn't a physical one. And this is exactly what Paul says will happen. The world is going to be given strong delusion so that they will believe the lie. They will look for a door, and they will find a thorn bush. They will look for a thorn bush, and they will find a door. In reality, they will search for God and they will find the Antichrist. They will see the Antichrist and they will think he is God. And the question is, what is the door that Lot was pulled through? It was the same door that you're gonna be pulled through. Do you remember today's text verse? Just prior to the tribulation in Revelation 4, chapter one, as the church age is ending, John saw a door open in heaven. And as he looked up there, he heard this voice, come up here. And he was in the presence of the Lord, just as Lot was pulled through that door and into the presence of the Lord. And what door did he see? He saw the exact same door that we're going to see. Jesus explains it very carefully in John chapter 10. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except, except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You see, everything, I don't care where you go in the Old Testament, everything points to Jesus Christ. If you've been through these 41 sermons like Kelly has, you'll know there is not a sermon where we don't find pictures of Jesus Christ in every single paragraph. It all points to him in one way or another. There is a spiritual blindness though, which covers the people of the world. But when we call on Jesus Christ as Lord, that blindness, that bansan varim, it is replaced with sight. Darkness is replaced with light. Condemnation is replaced with salvation and death is replaced with life. And I gotta tell you what, there is a time of evil coming upon the whole world. And this isn't just New Testament stuff. The Old Testament prophets talk about the day of the Lord far more than the New Testament does. And I gotta tell you, it's gonna be miserable for people that don't call on Jesus. The time is coming. I'm gonna read you what Isaiah says. It's a little long, but please bear with me. Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. That's Shaddai in Hebrew, and that means he is all powerful. So when he unleashes his anger at the sins of the people of the world, it is going to be cataclysmic. Therefore, all hands will be limp. Every man's heart will melt and they will be afraid. Pangs and sorrows will take hold of them. They will be in pain as a woman in childbirth. They will be amazed at one another. Their faces will be like flames, meaning they're gonna be in fever from what's going on in the world around them. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both 
wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate, and he will destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth, and the moon will not cause its light to shine. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will halt the arrogance of the proud and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make mortal man more rare than fine gold. Anybody know how much gold there is in the world? There ain't a lot. That's why it's, what, $3,000 an ounce or something right now? He'll make it more rare than fine gold. A man more than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth will move out of her place. In the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger, it shall be as the hunted gazelle and as a sheep that no man takes up. Every man will turn to his own people and everyone will flee to his own land. Everyone who is found will be thrust through and everyone who is captured will fall by the sword. Their children also will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Imagine the sadness of that because we're not willing to humble ourselves before the Creator. Their houses will be plundered and their wives ravished. It's Jesus who holds the key to life and death in his hands. And we have a hope and a promise in him, but we have a choice to make before that day of wrath comes. And I would certainly hope that you would make the right choice before it occurs. Now I'm gonna take just a minute, I'm all done with my sermon here. Before I get into my last thing of the day, I'm gonna take a minute, I wanna explain to you why Jesus Christ is important to you individually if you've never called on him as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says, and this goes right back to the very first words after man was created, that man fell. He sinned against God, and I gotta tell you what, a finite sin against an infinite creator is infinitely separating between you and that God. And the reason why is because we cannot go back in time. He's outside of time, he's infinite, but we can't go back and undo that sin. And because of that, that sin has transferred from Adam to his son, to his son, to his son, to his son, all the way through human history. And we know this right from the account of Cain and Abel, because they didn't do anything wrong as recorded in the Bible, and yet they went out and they sacrificed to the Lord because they knew that they bore a sin. And then one of them killed his brother. So we know that sin infected man from the very first man, and it is transferred down to us in three different ways. Legally, because we are legally under the federal head of Adam. Potentially, because we all exist, whether we are born or not. I could have six children or no children. We all potentially exist in Adam. And seminally, that means that we are physically born as human beings, and we are in Adam that way. And we can't go back and undo Adam's sin. And so we are separated from God because of that sin. And so what God did is he left the sins unattended for a certain amount of time. And then after that, he gave a law. He gave one to Noah. And then he came and he made a promise to Abraham. And through Abraham came the Jewish people. And he set up the law of Moses. And that was to show us it had two specific purposes, according to the New Testament, to show us how utterly sinful sin is. Because it says, if you do these things, you'll live by them. And then the Bible says that nobody can do those things. Nobody can meet the law of Moses perfectly. So why did he give it? To show us how utterly sinful sin is and to show us our need for something greater. And that greater thing is the Lord Jesus Christ who could fulfill the law. Why? Because he was born of a virgin and of the Holy Spirit. The sin transfers through the male, not the female. And so by being born in the womb of a virgin, he did not inherit that sin. And then he was capable and qualified of fulfilling that law that was given to Moses and he did do it. And then after, fulfilling that law, doing everything the Father had asked of him, he gave his own life up on the cross of Calvary as a substitution of atonement for you and for me and for the sins of the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so that's what God asks us to do, is to simply by faith say, I have sinned and I know I've sinned. And I understand that that infinitely separates me from God but that Jesus Christ being born of God is infinite in his divine nature and being born of Mary is finite in his human nature. And so he can bridge back from the finite to the infinite and he can mediate between God and man. And that's what he does for us when we call on him. If you call on the name of the Lord, this is it. This is how difficult it is. If you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. Now I gotta tell you, as easy as that is, it's the most difficult decision in the world because you have to put aside your own pride. You have to put aside your own sin and say, I cannot do it myself. And I want this wonderful savior who came from Abraham through the Jewish people, through the line of David. And he 
he was born. Please, if you've never made the commitment to Jesus Christ, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time of God's favor. Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for the opportunity to preach on that. You know I have one more thing that I love to do for these people, and I'm going to do it here in a minute, but I just wanted to give you the praise and the glory and the honor that you are due because you are just wonderful. Having given us pictures of our own unrighteousness and then sending your son into a world that would do these horrible things just to take that sin away from us and allow us reconciliation with you. Thank you, God. Thank you. Here we go. I got one more thing. I do this every single week. I uh, uh, write a poem on the particular verses that uh, we covered. Today was Genesis 19, verses 1 through 11, and I got a poem here for you. But before I give you that, I want to remind you that next week is Genesis 19, verses 12 through 26. And if you plan on being out here, please read those few verses. It's called The Destruction of Sodom. Yes, it's going to happen. Wake up, America. Okay? That's next week's sermon. But here we go. This is a poem called Safety Behind the Door. Two angels came to Sodom late in the day, and Lot was sitting in the gate of the city. And when he saw them, he rose to meet them on their way and bowed himself to the ground, not caring if he got gritty. And he said, my lords, please turn into your servant's place. Spend the night, yes, and wash your feet. Then you may rise early, just offer me this grace. After the night, you can then hit the street. And they said, no, we will spend the night in the open square. But Lot insisted strongly, no, please don't sleep out there. Then he made them a grand old feast. There was lots of food and drink and bread without any yeast. Now before they lay down to catch a little sleep, the perverts of the city, both young and old, gathered at the place. Everyone from the town came, every single creep, to commit acts which are a complete disgrace. Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out so we can abuse them. Don't put up a fight. But he went out through the door and the door was shut behind. And he begged, my brethren, don't so wickedly act. I have two virgin daughters, if you have the mind. Let me bring them out to you. With them, yes, please interact. Do nothing to these men, for they are under the shadow of my roof. I am obliged to their safety, and my daughters are the proof. And they said, stand back. You came here acting as a judge. Now it is you we will attack. Against you now we bear our grudge. So they pressed hard against the man lot and came near to break down the door. But the men pulled him inside to their safe spot and closed those wicked perverts who outside cussed and swore. And they struck the men at the doorway with blindness, both small and great, became weary trying to find the door. But Lot was protected because of his righteous kindness, and he would be safe from them. They would bother him no more. A day is coming for the righteous walking in this wicked world to be pulled into safety through the glorious door. When at the rapture, God's beautiful plan is unfurled. We will be in the presence of the Lord from then and forevermore. Yes, it is through Jesus that our future is assured. It is through his shed blood that we are eternally secured. And so we praise you, our precious King, and to you alone, all our praises we sing. Hallelujah and amen. Once again, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be out here and to hear your word and help us as a nation to repent of our wicked ways and to turn back to you. Help each one of us here to be a light and to speak out because if one man had spoken out, if Lot himself had just simply spoken out and brought 10 people to righteousness, the city would not have been destroyed. But we can see today that there aren't any wicked, any righteous, and so the wicked will be destroyed. And we will look forward to that next week in our sermon. But until that time, help us to be good stewards of the time you've given us and to tell others about you and your glory and about the wonderful deeds that you have done in human history for us in the person of Jesus Christ our Lord. And it is in his name we pray. Amen.